All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the work I've been doing at uh, Stanford during my postdoc um, about the topic of brachiopods and their evolution. So brachiopods are uh, quite an interesting group um, in that they're the dominant guild of Paleozoic uh, suspension feeding organisms. They're of course still around today, but with a much reduced diversity compared to the past. Uh, and they're sort of a relic of the Cambrian evolutionary fauna. So it's quite interesting that we have both this very uh, congruent and a complete uh, stratigraphic record. And we can also access most of the main families in the modern. Um, so that's exactly what we've um, set out to do, to sort of work out what's going on in the uh, brachiopod tree. So if you can ever sort of tell anything about evolutionary processes, it's probably from brachiopods. The issue to date has been that there has been um, no shortage of controversy in what the actual relationships of brachiopods are to each other and whether they actually constitute a monophyletic clade or not. So the sort of main competing hypotheses have been between uh, monophyly or paraphyly of brachiopoda with phronids either falling outside as the sister group or as an internal node. Um, and of course, when we think of this in, with sort of a tree thinking approach, this has some large implications for the evolution of biomineralization. The implication is that either phronids have lost their shell if they're um, paraphyletic, so indicated here on these two um, polygenic hypotheses by the broken line. Um, whereas if they're the sister group, then they never acquired a shell in the first instance. So even in this very sort of simplified um, diagrammatic sense, um, you can see how the sort of possible scenarios can sort of expand hugely. And then the sort of the secondary um, issue is how does actually biomineralization itself uh, evolve? So our um, sort of a, a simpli uh, the simplification here is we're just using a single origin of biomineralization indicated either by uh, phosphatic or calcitic um, types. And um, as you can see that, yeah, even using this sort of one or two characters, the possibilities um, sort of start expanding a lot. So essentially, there's been a to, to and fro between molecular and morphology um, between 18 ash trees and the traditional morphological classification. So uh, this is sort of also symptomatic of a wider issue of um, the relationships of lophotrochozoans more generally, which have been a very hard group to resolve. Um, annelids, uh, mollusks have all been very sort of challenging groups to work out how they actually relate to each other and where they fit within the tree. So brachiopods are sort of part of this, this wider picture of, uh, of conflict. Um, and indeed, are some of the familiar morphological groups actually natural groups like Lophophorata? Do bryzoans uh, have any connection to other lophophorate or lophophore bearing organisms uh, like brachiopods? So, to address this, uh, we set out to essentially sample as many modern brachiopods as we can with a global network of collaborators. Um, so, we're aiming to get at least um, sort of 10% of the extant diversity well spread across all the clades. We've already collected uh, off the coast of Maine. We've got material from uh, the Orkney, South Orkney Islands off Antarctica, from Japan. And this material is at various stages of um, sort of working its way through our pipeline. And we plan to also collect in Mexico, Panama, uh, Cape Verde and the Canary Islands and New Zealand as well. So re really try and get as full a picture of what's out there as possible um, and to get some good molecular data. So briefly going back to sort of uh, A-level biology, the central dogma of what we're looking at is um, nucleic acids. And specifically, we're looking at RNA, um, not DNA. And the reasoning behind that is if you actually look at DNA, it's full of all this sort of extra gubbins like regulatory sequences and promoters and also non-coding sequences like introns. So the typical DNA approach uh, was to use primers and things like this, but what we can do instead is to actually uh, sequence the entire transcriptome. So these are all of the uh, transcribed messenger RNAs and we can grab these guys literally by the tail um, and sequence essentially every expressed um, gene in the organism which then, of course, go on to make proteins that do stuff um, expressed in the phenotype. So very briefly going through our lab sort of pipeline, uh, collecting tissues, grinding them up in um, uh, liquid nitrogen and RNA later. We then produce um, cDNA libraries uh, through this process. I'm not going to talk about it too much. It's a very sort of standardized um, wet lab. Um, sort of setup, and then eventually these libraries go to sequencing and we do uh, as comprehensive and as deep sampling as we can of the, um, the tissues with uh, Illumina HiSec, um, usually about five or six tacks in a lane. 
and then it's sort of that's when the real work begins when we get our sort of our short read data and we have to reassemble those into some sort of sensible um, well the tree being the end goal but there's many many steps along the way of assembly of determining orthologs and all these kinds of things so I'll very briefly th run through a few bits of this pipeline um, so ultimately what we're trying to get instead of traditional approaches that have used one or two genes it's hundreds or thousands of um, coding genes that we're going to analyze uh, which is sort of 10 to 20 gigabytes per transcriptome. Um, so we end up with terabytes of raw data running through the various sort of um, steps to get to our, our final matrix. So this becomes sort of a, a big data challenge. Um, and then we have to try and sort of fish out the phylogenetically useful um, genes in this pipeline. So very briefly, our approach is to sort of use de novo assemblies. Um, there aren't many published brachypod genomes. So we're sort of assembling these things from scratch. Um, using Trinity, there's a lot of data quality check stages of our amino acids uh, data. And then we're using pre-existing uh, ortholog sets and a pre-existing alignment that we're adding our tax into for the, um, for the first draft of the uh, matrix. So it's a, a published matrix. And then we're using um, custom Python script to do Markov model searches for our genes of interest. Uh, so searching through these sort of whole, whole transcriptomes for our genes of interest and matching them up to uh, the pre-existing matrix then sort of just trimming everything up and then eventually coming out with a nice sort of well curated matrix um, in FASTA format. So uh, preliminary phylogenomic data, is this working? There we go, yeah. Um, yeah, it's based on the COSOT 2016 uh, Lofotrochozoan uh, data set. Um, and we've chosen this because it has a very wide range of outgroups and it's also been corrected for um, heterogeneous rates of evolution. So it's very sort of, uh, well curated gene set, uh, and these are all protein coding metabolic genes which are common across the sort of lofodrogozoan tree. We then do a model testing step to um, determine the best fitting evolutionary model for this given data set, which turns out to be the LG uh, amino acid model, which is just uh, the way in which the um, nucleic acids evolve in this group. And yeah, so this is just a way of accounting for some of the systematic bias in the data, um, which are, these are all sort of standard uh, techniques now in molecular biology. Um, so that brings us to the sort of initial results from our 12 published transcriptomes, which are just out there for brachiopods. Some of these were used in physiology experiments and not in a phylogenetic sense. So it's good to have that data out there. Um, we've been sort of working our own data through the pipeline. Um, these are at various stages of sequencing or assembly into the matrix, which essentially has given us uh, a concatenated super matrix of 22,000 amino acid sites with uh, it's sort of the balance coming out is about 75% occupancy. So there are some missing data where genes have not been found or else we've had crappy transcriptomes that didn't contain all our genes of interest. So we then do a maximum like, run a maximum likelihood search of this, which takes about three to five days on a workstation. So it's at the limit of what we can run on a desktop machine. And we're now sort of farming everything out to a supercomputing cluster uh, as we're getting into more complex models and bigger data sets. Um, so that takes me to the sort of the tree itself, which is the interesting part. And uh, the sort of initial runs have indicated that, so up here on the right, we have um, essentially the traditional morphological classification of Brachiopoda, that is um, Veronids as a sister group and the calcitic and phosphatic forms forming their own family. So the, in, this is the articulata and inarticulata um, with phronids as a sister group. So the take home message here in this quite busy tree is that um, paraphyly isn't a thing. Brachiopods seem to be monophyletic. So I'll just use a slightly simplified cladogram version of this, which is a bit easier to read. And you can see this pattern much more easily with um, cranids being the sister group to lingulids. Um, and terbratulinids and rinconellids forming their own clade. And these have relatively weak support values uh, at present, but that's, I th we think that's mainly down to some data quality issues. And as we add more transcriptomes and can remove some of the not so um, good data sets, that support value will increase. But the critical finding here is that uh, this node has 100% support, so brachiopods plus pheronids, so the sort of brachiozoa is a very well supported group, uh, as are. Um, the entire clade of brachiopods that has a very high bootstrap value as well um, with weaker support obviously as we get down sort of downstream and we'll also use more um, brachiopod specific orthologs um, to sort of address these questions further in future but what we're getting is sort of quite 
quite a consistent picture that monophyly does seem to be um, well supported in all of our analyses. And this then has implications for how biomineralization itself might have evolved. Um, so we can, we can probably um, discount it, the Fronids as being secondarily reduced brachiopods, which then, uh, if they're the sister group, and we have an assumption of a single origin of biomineralization, conceivably we can have a phosphatic ancestor. This has been the so-called Tomoted hypothesis, um, pushed by Lars Homer and colleagues and things I worked a lot in my PhD. Um, um, there's a very extensive early Cambrian record of phosphatic small shelly fossils before brachiopods are around. So yeah, it sort of lends more weight towards this as a possibly, uh, possible scenario for the assembly of the brachiopod uh, body plan, or else the other conceivable scenario is calcium carbonate um, being the ground state, but we don't find as much morphological evidence for that. So uh, we can sort of constrain what might have actually happened by using the molecular tree as a, as a backbone to map our characters. So where do we take this now? So this is sort of our first run through the data, and obviously this is still at an early stage, but um, lots of kind of exciting questions we can address with this. We can start using total evidence, integrating our morphological data with this, um, doing things like tip dating, look at ancestral character state reconstructions, such as with biomineralization, so doing this in a more um, objective and um, statistically congruent way. And of course, we can also use our excellent fossil record as um, calibration points for um, dating the evolution of brachiopods themselves. So yeah, ultimately giving a sort of dated time trees um, really giving us insight into dates and rates. So one other question that we think would be really interesting to address is, um, there was a paper from Mike Lee in 2013 about arthropods evolution. It's looking at elevated rates of evolution in the Cambrian. So is the Cambrian explosion a thing? And in the case with arthropods, they found a very strong signal um, that both morphological and molecular evolution was ev elevated um, during the Cambrian. So is this true of other phyla? And I think brachiopods are probably an ideal test case for this, if this is a more extensive uh, phenomenon. So we're at the point where we can almost start to address this now with the brachiopod data set, and I think it'll be really interesting either to see if this is a, a consistent picture um, or not. Either way, it's, it'll be a very interesting finding as to what the actual nature of the, um, the Cambrian radiation is in a group with an excellent fossil record. Um, so just to wrap up and conclude things, um, so it looks like, yeah, brachyzoa, brachypods plus pheronids, the traditional morphological classification is well supported by extensive phylogenomic data sets. Okay. Um, there is support for articulata and inarticulata. So that's the calcitic and phosphatic um, brachypods forming clades uh, in line with traditional nomenclature, but with weaker support, uh, although we still need to look into more group specific characters for those. Um, the other finding, I didn't, I sort of skipped over this, um, but bryozoans did not come out uh, close to brachiopods in the tree, which is kind of an interesting finding that lophophorata in the sense of things with the lophophore all being related may not be a natural group. Um, and there's some developmental evidence that this also may be the case. So uh, we'll look into this a bit more, but um, should, yeah, take caution in using lophophorata as a, um, as a natural clade. Uh, and ultimately, having a well-resolved phylogeny based on both the morphological and molecular records um, can really give us insight into how biomineralization evolves in this clade. So that then allows us to produce and test models, mechanisms, and rates of evolution in brachiopods and for the Cambrian explosion more generally. So um, with that, thanks very much for listening.